Lord, you know. I want you to listen to Place on Word Radio. Doing like an altar call. And basically what he does on the altar call, he goes, everyone here who believes they're going to heaven, stand up. Number of people stand up. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, anyone here who believes they're going to hell, stand up. Now Lincoln is somewhat in the front row or near the front row. He doesn't stand up either time. My man. Peter Cartwright comes over to him and says, Mr. Lincoln, where are you going? And Lincoln goes, well, I didn't realize I'd be singled out when I came here. But as for me, I'm going to Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Back in time for a closer look at the life of a man who never compromised his principle. With Bibles throughout the White House, he spoke of reconciliation with and repentance towards God and for giving our enemies all timely lessons, especially today. Hello and welcome to Plays on Word Radio, where we discuss, analyze, work, and play on the Word of God. Thank you for joining us on this excursion today. Let's join Pastor Teddy, also known as Fred David Kenny Jr., the founder of Plays on Word Theater, as he does a deep dive into the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank you very much, Josh Taylor and Katie Kenny. Uh, welcome to Place on Word Radio, Radio Family. Today we are going to visit with my former pastor, Pastor Cliff Whitehead at Fellowship Chapel in New Jersey. And Cliff Whitehead is a historian as well. And he is known for his Gettysburg, spiritual Gettysburg tour, where he teaches the battles on the battlefield of Gettysburg, but then at night he teaches a spiritual aspect of spiritual warfare. Well, he's got a new um, retreat that I'm gonna let him tell you about. You gotta check, put your history hats on y'all. We've done that tour over 20 times, the battlefield, you know, the three days. And then earlier this year, the Lord kind of, I believe the Lord was laying on my heart to do something because I, I've always studied also Abraham Lincoln and I've always admired Abraham Lincoln. If you read about Abraham Lincoln, I mostly studied him mostly from his presidency and also as um, it affected the Civil War. But I always knew that Lincoln was someone who revered the Bible and he used scripture quotes a lot. And so I felt led that I really wanted to um, put together a tour so this is the first time we're doing this tour is in November. And it's called the Gospel and the Gettysburg Address Tour Conference. Nice. And it's two days okay. and one night. Okay. Okay, so th this year is November 3rd or 4th. It's a Friday and a Saturday. One of the reasons we wanted to do it, there's a number of reasons we wanted to do it uh, two days and one night, and particularly Friday and Saturday is, you know, I know that I would love a lot. I would love some pastors to come out to this way. It frees them up. They can get back for their Sunday service and things like that. It's something that really just came together. You know how sometimes you, you feel like when something comes together in a, a certain way, you know the Lord's hand is in it. Yeah. You know, and basically the teachings are, the whole tour is 25 hours okay. based on the fact that when Lincoln came to Gettysburg, in November of 1863, right, four months after the battle, to give his um, Gettysburg Address, right. right? He spent 25 hours there. Wow. He came in. He actually finished the Gettysburg that's Address really cool. in Gettysburg. Right, right, that's really cool. So the train station he came in on is still there. That's where we start our tour. Okay. Uh, we start at 2 o'clock on Friday afternoon. And so we, we start off at the train station i give background there tell what went on there and then right around the corner from it is the wills house it's now a museum wills george wills was a lawyer um in gettysburg and he was instrumental in uh, the dedication of the soldiers national cemetery that lincoln was coming to dedicate right. and lincoln stayed at his home okay the night before he gave the gettysburg and it's in one of the bedrooms that lincoln stated that he finished the gettysburg address okay. That is now a free museum. So we go from the train station to there, and I, we go through it. I point out some of the things I want people to take note of that fit in with our tour, but then they can spend the rest of the time looking at the whole museum. Okay. And that takes us from about 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, and then there's a check-in for people to check into the hotel. People are for dinner. They're on their own. Okay. And then at 7 o'clock that night, we start the teaching. And the teaching on Friday night is uh, the Bible's influence on Lincoln as a man and as president. 
Okay, so that's that's the Friday night one. Okay. And then, so there's a teaching there. Then we're going to have a Q&A at the end of the teaching. Okay. And then the next morning, there's breakfast in the hotel. And then we, what we do after breakfast is we go out. We have the teaching on Saturday morning. Okay. Okay. And the teaching on the Saturday morning is is titled The Gospel and the Gettysburg Address. And what we, we see in that is the gospel's influence on the Gettysburg Address. Gettysburg Address, right. Okay, so uh, that is um, that morning. And then what we do is we actually, we're at, the, we're at a hotel that's right across the street from where Lincoln stayed, the place of the museum. Okay. So after the teaching is over, we um, walk from where Lincoln stayed, and we follow his footsteps on Baltimore Street, it's a little over a half mile to the cemetery, the Evergreen Cemetery. Yeah, right. I've been right. So, and as we're going down Baltimore Street, I also take the time to give, give a little of the history of the town and what it experienced during the battle. Show some of the bullet holes. Right. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of interesting. So, and then we go by these two big witness trees. Yeah. That were yeah. there oh, when they, Lincoln walked. They by. were there. Yes. And then we go up to the cemetery, and I give a history of the two cemeteries. The Evergreen Cemetery was the town cemetery. It was there. Started in 1853. So we actually go into that cemetery, give a little history of that cemetery. Some famous people of the town are, are uh, buried there. And then what happened was the government bought some of the property from the Evergreen Cemetery for the Soldiers National Cemetery. There, So they're right up against one another. Right. And so then I get the history of the Soldiers National Cemetery, the dedication day when Lincoln was there. And I give the whole story there mm. and then we actually read the Gettysburg Address right where Lincoln gave it. it and then at the end of that we go back down the other side of Baltimore Street to give more history of the town oh, I love it. and we go back to the hotel for lunch and then basically at, well, lunch will be at like one o'clock by the time we get there and while we're having lunch we're going to have a Q&A based okay. on either the teaching the night before the teaching that morning or Great. part of the tour and then at the end at about about two forty five, we go around the corner again from the hotel to the train station. Mm. We talk about Lincoln's departure and very quickly about, you know, his election. He's assassinated, but yeah. his second inaugural address. Now here's the thing, Dale. One of my heartbeat is, and I'm really studying a lot of different sources right now. I'm reading a book um, that was written in 1820 by a pastor, and the title of the book is "The Soul of Abraham Lincoln." In 1820 or 1920? I'm sorry, 19, oh, yeah, I'm like, well, 1920. I'm sorry. He's, he's got a time machine. <laughs> I'm glad you corrected me on that. <laughs> yeah. so, so anyway, the... Um, Still, though, that's close enough, 1920. Yes, and he's got a lot of primary sources. I mean, that, it's, it's just to put in perspective, it's 2023, and there are many people listening right now that can remember back to 1968, 69, 64, right. 63. So it's not... It's within a right. lifetime of somebody. Right, and some of the people he knew, right. because he wrote this when he was in his 60s. Okay. And he had retired as he was a pastor. Okay. And he retired, and he devoted himself to looking into the faith of Abraham Lincoln and oh, wrote a book, wow, wrote a, a number of books on Lincoln. Book. And so he just takes primary sources. Okay. So one of the controversies is... Was Lincoln a born-again believer? Right. Okay, so that's in, it's a very interesting... Yeah. Um, so that's what I want to look into, okay. because we certainly know that the Bible influenced him. So I've been studying from his childhood, right, okay. right through his uh, young man. Well, they didn't have they didn't have the, what they called the teenage phenomenon back then. It was it's young, like, young adult, young adult. Okay, <laughs> okay, and then in, and then into his um, time as a lawyer, then as a politician, then as president. And so you know, everyone tries to claim Abraham Lincoln as their own. <laughs> you know, the atheists will say, "Oh, yeah, you know." Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you had even some things like um, even sometime during when communism was starting, when Lenin, the whole thing with communism, they were even trying to embrace Lincoln. Like there was this conference, Lenin and Lincoln. You know? <laughs> really? Are you serious? Yeah, you know. A conference? Right. I'd like to go to that just to hear it. <laughs> so, you know, and wow. But what's interesting, and I think I'll share this. Let me put it this way. I think believers will be pleasantly pleased with the conclusion I make about that question. Okay. Was Lincoln a born-again Christian? Okay, all right. One of the reasons there's a controversy is he never made a public profession of faith mm -hmm. as we know it today. You right. know what I mean? Like, in right. other words, back then... I'm born again. Well, that, I'm glad you used that term. And we know that's a scriptural term. It's a great yeah. term. Yeah. 
Oh, but they didn't use that term. They used the word converted. As I've been studying it, and as I'm studying, I'm praying about it, this verse comes to my mind that I think is a real um, theme of Lincoln's life. Okay. Jeremiah 29, 11, 13. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Right. And then the other, the other goes that came kind of piggyback to that is uh, Hebrews eleven six that you know uh, the Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently yes. seek Him. Yes. Seek for me with all your heart and diligently seek me, and I'm a rewarder of that. That to me is what Lincoln was. He had a faith journey. And he had to work himself through a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. He grew up in the backwoods of Kentucky. His mom and dad went to a Baptist church that was ultra-Calvinistic to the point where they believed that God created some people for the purpose of judgment. Yeah, yeah. And Lincoln could never embrace that. How do you reconcile all that? Right. And back then they had, um, there were these settlements. There weren't any real established churches. In the East, there were, in the South, but out in Kentucky. And they had preachers that were, they called them circuit riders. Oh, yeah, yeah. Circuit and so, ride, yeah. like, in other words, the town that Abraham Lincoln grew up in, if somebody died, yeah. they buried them the next day. Right. They might not have the service for a month until the preacher came back around. Wow. So, in other words, they didn't have weekly wow. services yeah. with a preacher. Okay. They might have met and prayed. It's when somebody came out. And you didn't know who you were necessarily going to get. <laughs> oh, 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 boy. <laughs> it was a potluck, I guess. So Ay. what I'm saying is Lincoln's skepticism yeah. was not necessarily about God's word. But he, he worked him. He wasn't somebody who was going to just take someone's word for something. Right, right. It's, the Bereans were counted more noble because they right. didn't just take well, the word a point. for it. But he, like, again, he, he would read. The, that was a constant in his life that he would read the scriptures. Yeah. And he went through a um, difficult time in his life where there was some skepticism, but he never, ever really turned his back on the scriptures. Okay. You know, he started to get into some of the stuff by um, some of the free thinkers and stuff. It was but, a very weird period of time. Right. Like, as far as... And that was in his 20s. Yeah. Okay. So, 1800s. And so you had the, the Age of Enlightenment yes. and all right. that. Yeah. That. So he was working himself through that. And then, but he, he always went back to the scriptures, you know. Okay. For instance, then he got into politics. Yeah. And he always looked at God's wisdom and word for the politics and, and his decisions. And just to show you how he saw Christianity being abused, there was a fellow that he ran against who was a preacher, but who was using the scripture oh, and his right. position to get himself elected. That wasn't Douglas. Uh, no, no, it was a guy named Peter Cartwright. So Lincoln was running against him for Congress. Okay. okay. So Lincoln had a couple of debates with him, and this guy held tent revivals, right? So Lincoln goes to the tent revival, and he wants to hear what this guy has to say, what he's saying about the Word of God and mm -hmm. so forth. So the guy gives his message, and then he's doing like an altar call. And basically what he does in the altar call, he goes... Everyone here who believes they're going to heaven, stand up. Number of people stand up. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, anyone here who believes they're going, and has them all sit down. Anyone here who believes they're going to hell, stand up. <laughs> okay. Wow. Now, Lincoln is somewhat in the front row or yeah. near the front row. He doesn't stand up either time. My man. Peter Cartwright comes over to him and says, Mr. Lincoln. You know, oh, he I, saw him in the audience. Yes. It, it, oh, he sees him in the audience. He goes, oh, boy. Mr. Lincoln. He goes... <laughs> I noticed when I said, who's ever going to heaven here, stand up. And you didn't stand up. And then I said, who's ever going to hell, stand up. And you didn't stand up. Mr. Lincoln, where are you going? And Lincoln goes, well, I didn't realize I'd be singled out when I came here. But as for me, I'm going to Congress. <laughs> oh, brilliant answer, man. What? But you know what I mean? He wouldn't, he wouldn't let himself be manipulated. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And so it wasn't that he was downing the gospel. Right, right. But this guy was just... Manipulate, yeah. You know, and so uh, I think he was misread a lot. But as you study his life, right. and you get up towards, um, you get up towards uh, Gettysburg. Yes, right. You see a lot of, like, in other words, he quoted scripture a lot. When did his wife die? 
His wife didn't die until after him. His son died. Uh, his, his son, son Willie right. in that's the White right. House yes, in 1862. I know he suffered a death in 1862, so it was a year before Gettysburg. Yes. And he had real hard time with that. Oh, he did. Or, and his wife suffered severe depression because of that. Just yeah. imagine this, Ted. Your country is shooting at you. Have, like, our country is divided today, right. right? They were divided and shooting at one another mm. back in, you know, during the Civil War. Yeah. And it's 1862. And if you remember our little our brief history lesson yes. there on 1862 is when the war is not going good for Lincoln. That's um, the Battle of uh, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville is 18, mm-hmm. early 1863. Right. Lee is winning most of the in the East, you know. It's looking bad. And it's looking bad. So, so he's got that burden and his son dies at the same time. And Ugh. I love this story. There's a a friend of Mary Lincoln's who's one of the servants in the White House tells this story that just at this time, it was shortly after Willie, Willie died, bad news from the war front, and Lincoln came into the room. He left the, you know, those offices of the White House, came into the room, and he had such a look of gloom on his face and just worn out. And she said he walked by and he went into the parlor and the door was left open. And he sat down and he took out his Bible. And she said he had Bibles at different parts of the White House and the different rooms, you know. And he took out, and, they, and the way she describes it. You never it, hear that in any history book. No. And this is a firsthand account. This is not someone writing a book 100 years later. Right. This is, you know, so it, it, she, she says she sits on, he sits on the sofa and his long legs are draped over the end. You can kind of picture uh, the end of the couch, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he's reading, and um, he's in there about a half an hour. And he said he came out, and his countenance had seemed to lighten so much. Mm. Wow. And she was curious as to what part of the Bible he was reading. So after he left and walked out, she walked into the parlor, and he had happened to, I guess, leave it open. Nice. And he was in the book of Job. Oh, wow. And, but, you know, so people that were very close to him knew how much he relied on the Word of God. Yeah. And one of the things, he also struggled with depression. Mm -hmm. But what you start to see around 1862, particularly going into 1863 in Gettysburg, and from there to the time of his second inauguration and his second inaugural address, is you see his focus when it comes to how he's using Scripture. Mm -hmm. More focus on reconciliation and redemption. I mean, he always uses scripture, you know, right. like a country divided itself again, it cannot stand, right? right? right, right. But now it's focused on redemption mm. and it's focused on reconciliation. Right, yeah. Uh, James Dean Kennedy, did I have that name right? Uh, uh, Dr. Pat- D. James Kennedy. Right. I remember him. <laughs> uh, Sunday mornings. It's yeah. believed by him and some others that it was somewhere around the time of the Gettysburg Address or after he left that, mm-hmm. that he gave his heart to Christ. And, said, and, and But the thing is, again, there was never a public profession of faith. He yeah. shared it with some people. Yeah. But the skeptics would say, well, how do you know that? You know what I mean? That's hearsay or right. whatever. But what you see is, to me, why I'm convinced that he knew Christ yeah. as a Savior is this journey. Yeah. He right. sought the Lord. So, yeah. And the Lord drew if him. If you seek God, you're going to... You're gonna, and you're the gonna, Lord rewarded him. Right. And I believe there's some stories out there, too, that um, he was planning. And I have to look more into this. So if you come to the retreat, maybe I'll have some, maybe I'll have something more definitive on this. But, well, we know this. On Good Friday, he was, um, in 1865, he was on a carriage ride with, and this is after the war. Appomattox was just the April 9th. Right. The okay, war was right. basically yeah, was pretty much over yeah. at that point. And he's riding with Mary Lincoln on Friday, on Good Friday, and they're out in the carriage ride. And he says to her, uh, you know, now that this war is almost over, he goes, I want to take, and he said to Mary, he said, you know, we've been kind of uh, estranged from one another. He goes, but I want to, I want to go to Israel Mm. and I want to walk in the steps of the Savior. Wow. And it's believed that he was going to make a public profession of faith that mm. Sunday. Wow. This is Good Friday. Wow. He's assassinated that night. Yeah, wow. Oh, my goodness. But I'm doing some more research on that. Okay, all right. All right, okay. but, but to I me... I love it, I love it. To me, what affirms it in my heart 
is the Lord's given me these two scriptures. Yeah. And like as I'm reading and researching, these are the two scriptures that keep, keep coming, coming to my back. mind. Yeah. Yeah. So while we want to have evidence, I believe that the Lord, you know, it always comes down to faith. But you to make at, a, even making a statement like that, I, I want to walk in the Savior. In the Savior, I just don't see somebody who doesn't really believe saying that. They might say, "I, I want to see where Jesus went." Well, if you notice, but if you notice his steps, I mean, if you did, you see the Lincoln movie, Daniel Day, Daniel Lewis. Day Lewis. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, terrific. If you were, if you watch the end of that movie, they show the carriage ride. Oh, they do with Mary. I don't remember with that. Mary Lincoln. I can watch it now. But if you notice in the movie, they have him saying, I want to walk in the steps of King David. Is that right? But that's not what he said. That's not. (laughs) (laughs) See, this is the type of stuff you guys get on the retreat, I'm telling you. That's amazing. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Hollywood would change it to King David. Of course. I'm not surprised. Now, as a Christian, we wouldn't object to that. Only if we know what he really said. Right. (laughs) Right. That's, That's fascinating. You know, actually, that... That brings up one other thing that we, you talked about the Gettysburg Address, and there was a dude that was an orator. Yes. Before Lincoln. Edward Everett. And he spoke for how long? Two hours. Two hours. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you guys out there that think my sermons are long, you should <laughs> Oh, man. Two hours. But, you know, these guys back then, these orators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they were yeah. well known. Like, yeah. in other words, they, of course, they didn't have TV back People then. People would go to see them. They would come to a town, and they would give an oration on history or fiction or whatever it might be, and people would come and listen to them for two, two three hours. hours, you know. And and these guys didn't have notes in front of them. The orators, yeah. So Edward Everett was well known. Edward Everett. The cemetery was dedicated on November the nineteenth, okay, eighteen sixty three. And so they wanted Edward Everett to be the guest speaker. Okay. So when they advertised, in other words, they set the date, right. November 19th, based on his schedule. Because he was in this town this day, and okay. so he fit it into his schedule. <laughs> and so it said, basically, the poster said, you know, dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery, mm. featured speaker Edward Everett, and then underneath, a few appropriate words by President Lincoln. Is that right? Yeah. Nobody remembers what Everett said, but the Gettysburg Address is memorized by people even today. 262 words. <laughs> he said. And Edward Everett, he gave his oration. People yeah. applauded. And basically, he gave a history of America. Right, right. Up to the Civil War, including the Civil yeah. War. But Lincoln, now he was sick in Gettysburg. He had like a chest oh, right, cold. Right. And he got up and he gave the Gettysburg Address. And 262 words. And he thought he bombed out. Yeah, what was the response on the ground? At Some the time? polite applause. Okay. Some people were cheering it, it wasn't like, that's the greatest thing since the Sermon on the Mount. Right. But you know, <laughs> it, the thing was is that he thought he bombed out. Okay. And then the next day, Edward Everett told him, he said, Mr. Lincoln, you came closer to the central truth of the matter in two minutes than I did in two hours. Wow. But And we know now it's probably, I think it's the most inspired human speech. Yeah. I mean, Scripture is set apart by yeah, itself. Yeah, apart, but that's, the Gettysburg know, Address stands alone. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, you, you um, like four score and seven years ago it comes from Scripture. Yeah. And the whole theme yeah. about, you know, a nation, birth of the nation, new yeah. birth. And so on that Saturday morning, we go into the details of that. Oh, The Bible's, yeah. inf- I mean, the Gospel's influence. Gospel's influence, influence. I love it. The Gettysburg oh. Address. And there's the cadence of the Gettysburg Address, the cadence he gave it in, yeah. is the cadence of the King James Version Bible, the way the words mm, flow. Yeah. There's no doubt that, I mean, they didn't have 200 channels with nothing on yeah. the cable TV back then. Nope. They, didn't have, uh, they didn't have movie theaters. They did have theater, but they didn't have, I mean, many people a lot of times would sit around and discuss the Bible, talk the Bible. Most, a lot of people knew the Bible, so it was a textbook in school. Kids learn to read through the, sure, read sure. the Bible. That in the Sears catalog. <laughs> no, really, <laughs> the back in the war on Sears, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. That's how they learned to read, most of them. Now, you just think of this war, right? You basically you had Americans fighting against each other, Americans that worshiped the same God. Right. You know, and so it was like, you know, mm. South was saying God's on our side. The North was saying God's on our side. Mm. And so, you know, Lincoln said, um, he said, one might be right, but both can't be right. Right. But both can be wrong. Both can be wrong. <laughs> and then, they, then he finally said, he said this, he goes, my concern is not that God be on my side, but that I be on God's side because God is always right. Like the, the angel of the Lord speaking to Joshua there, you know, Joshua's like, Who's, whose side are you on? <laughs> the Lord was like, 
I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm the commander of the Lord's army. You, yeah. you need to be on my side, buddy. <laughs> Take off your shoes. Wear your stance. Hot, the holy crown. Yeah. And isn't that the thing? We is there a lesson we could take from that? We need to be on the Lord's side and not right. be trying to pick sides. Yeah, be on. I think you know. I think what we've got in politics today, if I can give my little yes, spirit, it's yes, <laughs> okay, is I think you've got divisiveness is winning the day. Mm. Um, and Lincoln, Lincoln was a man of principle. He never compromised his principles. But he's somebody who reached out to the other side. Mm. And he never attacked personally. Yeah. Like, you know, so he, would, he would hold his principles in debate and right. so forth. But he never attacked the other person. And he never seemed to, and if he never really took things personally to the point where he had a vendetta. Mm. And you know, by the end of the war, you had Southerners appreciating him. I mean, there were some that hated him mm-hmm. because they, you know, they, they you know, the guys that were really wanted slavery to last forever. Right. Right. But you had guys like, um, someone said when Jefferson, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, mm. someone said to Jefferson Davis, Mr. Davis, you must be so happy here in bed. He goes, no, he goes, I could think of thousands of others I'd rather have assassinated <laughs> than Mr. Lincoln. Yeah. And Lincoln, and it, when, when one of the things we look at at the train station before we leave Gettysburg is his second inaugural address. Yeah. And the second inaugural address is not that long, and it's almost like a sermon. Yeah, and it right. talks about reconciliation. He said we all were wrong. Mm. It wasn't just the South. Whoa, we he were, stepped on some toes in the well, North with that, oh, by saying that. Absolutely. I forgot he said that. Because he understood that when this country started, the North had slavery too. Yeah. Wow. And he felt that this war was part of God's judgment on the nation. But again, he believed that it was disciplinary, that mm. God still loved the people, but he was disciplining them. So that was, you know, that was that's, huge. That, yeah, that's, wow. And he said that the nation needs to repent. What politician do you hear use the word repent today? I mean, he, he said it a number of times in the last two years of his life. So there's more indication that he was that a word. changed man. Yeah, it, people that are not changed don't talk about repenting. No. No, it's and, only with the spirit of God working on you saying, you know what, I need to repent of my sins. Right. We need to repent. Turn around and face the Lord. I, you know, turn. And that's, that's the thing. fascinating. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is that he was, um, I mean, this is my conviction, is when you get, by the time you get to that second inauguration, yeah. he's talking reconciliation with God, right. repentance towards God, not just as a nation, but as individuals. Individuals and a nation. Yeah, wow. And the whole idea of forgiving our enemies. Mm, amen, amen. We're going to have links for Cliff stuff uh, up here, and we're going to continue this conversation next time. But until next Friday, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. <laughs>